Our next talk by Peter Vanderhorst uh, will be given by a ghost, I think. What does it say? A proxy? I think that's a computer program. Oh, no, no. It's Kathleen Benelek, who's a graduate student uh, in the Department of Anthropology at UC San Diego. And you're going to give Peter Vanderhorst's talk. And yep. what's the title of it? Uh, From Liberation to Expulsion, the Exodus in the Earliest Jewish Pagan Polemics. Yes, on that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks. And I probably won't be able to answer any questions. <laughs> so, from the very beginning of the Hellenistic period, the story of the Exodus played a pivotal role in Jewish pagan polemics. This raises several questions. Why was it the Exodus? Why wasn't this the stories about Abraham and the other patriarchs or another story that the pagan polemicists focused upon? Where did they get their information about the stories of the Exodus? Did the Jews react to the pagan versions of the Exodus story? And if so, how did they? Many other questions as well come to mind when one takes a look at the evidence. In the modest compass of this paper, only a few of these questions can be dealt with, and only briefly at that. Let us first present a quick survey of the evidence. We have 14 Exodus stories from pagan, Greek, and Roman writers. Obviously, it is impossible to pay attention to all of them. For that reason, I've decided to restrict my survey to the Greek authors with an Egyptian, and more specifically, an Alexandrian background. These are Manetho, Lysimachus, Chiron, and Appion. They span more than three centuries and demonstrate both the continuity and diversity in pagan anti-Jewish Exodus traditions. Manetho, an Egyptian priest who wrote a history of Egypt in Greek, tells the story of the Exodus in such a way that it became a counter-history that proved to be one of the most powerful anti-Jewish statements in ancient history. But in order to put his story into perspective, it should be noted that before presenting his version of the Exodus, Manetho had informed his readers about the Hyksos, a Western Asiatic nation that had occupied and ruled over Egypt from about 1650 to 1540 BCE. There he tells us about the invasion of the country by the Hyksos and their brutal reign of terror. They burned the cities, demolished the temples of the gods, slaughtered many male Egyptians, and enslaved their wives and children's, uh, children. One of their kings founded the city of Avaris, a, a place having very strong religious associations with Set or Typhon, the god of confusion and chaos. After a long time, there was a revolt of the natives against the Hyksos, which resulted in the siege of Avaris. Finally, they left Egypt and built a city they called Hierosolima in the region of Judea. It is this mention of Jerusalem that induces Josephus, who quotes this passage, to happily claim that Manetho rightly regarded the Hyksos as the ancestors of the Jews, which proves, in his view, that the Jews could never have originally been Egyptians. And this is relevant for what follows, for when later on Josephus quotes Manetho's Exodus story, the latter seems to imply exactly that, much to the anger of Josephus, who inserts that here Manetho contradicts himself. In the second passage, we read the following. King Amenophis felt a desire to see the gods and said so to his namesake, the prophet Amenophis, Amenhotep. The latter told the king that he would be able to see the gods only if he cleansed the country of lepers and other unclean people. The king then rounded up all those in Egypt with deformed bodies, some 80,000 of them, and put them to work in the stone quarries to the east of the Nile so that they would be productive as well as isolated from the other Egyptians. There were even some learned priests among them who were afflicted with leprosy. After those in the quarries had suffered there for a long time, they asked the king to give them as a refuge the city of Avaris that had been abandoned by the shepherds, the Hyksos, and had been sacred to Typhon from the beginning. The king granted their request, and once they had settled there, they appointed Asarsef, a priest from Heliopolis, as their leader and took an oath of total obedience to him. He legislated on the principle of normative inversion that they should not worship the gods or revere any of the sacred animals. <coughs> Rather, they should consume them and attach themselves to no one except their fellow conspirators. Asarsef laid down other laws as well that were completely contrary to Egyptian customs and prepared his people for war against the king. He formed a council with other unclean priests. They sent ambassadors to the shepherds in Jerusalem and asked them to unite in an expedition against Egypt. The latter were delighted, and some 200,000 men, they set off and arrived in Avaris. King Amenophis was frightened. He assembled a great number of Egyptians and consulted with their leaders. He ordered the most sacred animals and the images of the gods to be brought into safety. He avoided battle, but set out for Ethiopia with his whole army, where he was welcomed by the king, who provided them with anything they needed for their daily life. The mixed army of unclean Egyptians and Jerusalemites treated the population of Egypt in a very cruel and sacrilegious way. 
They burned the cities and villages, pillaged the temples, mutilated the images of the gods, used the sanctuaries as kitchens to prepare the sacred animals for consumption, and forced the priests to slaughter these. The man who laid down their laws, Asarsif, when changing his allegiance, also changed his name and was henceforth called Moses. Later, Amenophis advanced from Ethiopia, attacked the shepherds and the polluted people, and expelled them to Syria. This, according to Manetho, explains the origins of the Jewish people. The following should be noted here. It is obvious that the whole story is patterned upon Manetho's own story of the Hyksos, as summarized above. To put it another way, originally this was not a story about the Jews, but one about the Hyksos, that only at the very end was made into a story about the Jews by means of a gloss, most probably added by Manetho himself, in which he identifies Osarsif with Moses. But there's more. As has been suggested most forcefully by Jan Asman, the traumatic experience of Akhenaten's fanatically monotheistic experiment in the Amarna period is at the background here and shaped the Hyksos tradition because Manetho's story is about a religious confrontation and there is only one episode in Egyptian history that corresponds to these characteristics, the Amarna period. <clears throat> As Asman argues, dislocated Amarna reminiscences began to be projected onto the Hyksos and their god Baal, who is equated with the Egyptian god Seth. The Hyksos conflict was thus turned into a religious conflict. This process of distortion continued through the centuries as events occurred that fit into the story of religious otherness and its dangerous semantics of abomination and persecution. It is important to realize that cultural memories of both the Hyksos and the Amarna period shaped a template or mold into which later experiences with the Jews could be made to fit. The Exodus story of the Jews and the conflict that arose between Jewish monotheism and pagan polytheism in the Hellenistic period are here made to fit into the template of the amalgamated memory of both the Amarna and Hyksos periods. Moreover, the mention of Avaris makes clear that the Jews are seen as adepts of the evil god Typho. In the four centuries after Manetho, we find in the writings of Greco-Roman authors a whole series of more or less similar stories about the Exodus in which the divergencies should be explained by assuming that they are not just copying one another, but also using different sources, whether oral or written. As I said, I will only briefly mention those of Egyptian or Alexandrian provenance. Lysimachus probably lived in the second century BCE, but we do not know his exact dates. He was an Alexandrian, though not a native Egyptian, but a Greek. He is important in that he shows that Manetho's version of the Exodus story is modified in the sense that the Jews' supposed anti-Egyptian stance is broadened to an attitude that is more generally opposed to the values of humankind at large. Lysimachus tells us that in the time of King Bolchorus, the Jews, who were afflicted with leprosy, scurvy, and other maladies, took refuge in the temples and lived a mendicant existence. The spread of their diseases caused a failure of the crops, whereupon the oracle of the god Ammon told the king to purge the temples of these impure people, drive them out into the desert, and to drown those afflicted with leprosy and scurvy. The latter were indeed drowned, the others were exposed in the desert to die. But those in the desert assembled, kept a fast, and implored the god to save them. On the next day, a certain Moses advised them to take a straight course through the desert until they reached inhabited territory. He also instructed them to show goodwill to no one, never to give the best, but always the worst advice, and to destroy sanctuaries and altars of the gods wherever they found them. The others agreed, and after a difficult journey, they arrived in an inhabited land. There they maltreated the people and plundered and burned the temples. Thereafter, they came to Judea, where they founded a city they called Hirosila, uh, temple plunder or sacrilege, because of their propensities, but later changed the name to Hirosalima in order not to spoil their reputation. Uh, later, Josephus adds to the information that Lysimachus had called Moses a wizard and deceiver and labeled the Jewish people as the lowest of humankind. In its full version, this account bristles with inconsistencies, but we leave that matter out of account because it does not affect our argument. Moreover, the matter has been adequately dealt with at length by others. <clears throat> Apart from other differences with Manetho, which may go back to different oral traditions, what is most striking about this report is that it is made clear right from the start that it is a story about the Jews and Moses, and hence is a specimen of outspoken anti-Jewish propaganda. The drowning of the lepers is nothing but a reversal of the drowning of the Egyptians, our Egyptian army in the sea, according to the book of Exodus. Furthermore, Lysimachus makes clear that what he has to say about the Jews has much wider implications than just for Egypt and the Egyptians. 
Moses also instructed them to show goodwill to no one, never to give the best but always the worst advice, and to destroy sanctuaries and altars of the gods wherever they found them. It is this generalization that, for the first time, turns the Jews into enemies of humankind as a whole and adversaries of religion and piety. It is from this writer onwards that the image of the Jews as misanthropes and atheists became a stock element in the anti-Jewish propaganda of pagan antiquity. Lysimachus is the first author in whom we can clearly discern how the originally anti-Hyksos and anti-Amarna reminiscences have grown out into a fully-fledged anti-Jewish version of the Exodus with wide-ranging implications. If we now jump to the first century CE, we again meet two Alexandrian scholars, both of Egyptian descent, whose Exodus stories have developed into decidedly anti-Jewish propaganda, Chiramon and Appion. Their stories follow the by now familiar pattern. Chiramon has his own variants. The goddess Isis appeared to King Amenophis, blaming him for the fact that her temple had been destroyed. This frightened him, but the sacred scribe uh, Frida Bautis said that he would find relief if he purged, purged Egypt of those who had impurities. He then collected some 250,000 of these noxious people and expelled them. They were led by two scribes, Moses and Joseph, their Egyptian names being Tisithen and Petisef. They went to Pelusium and met 380,000 people there, whom Amenophis had not wanted to give access to Egypt. They made an alliance with these people and marched against Egypt. Amenophis fled to Ethiopia, but later his son Ramses expelled the Jews and drove them into Syria. So much for Chiramon's account. In spite of the differences, it is clear that Chiramon followed the same basic structure as Manetho's Exodus story. What is striking, however, is that the motifs of misanthropy and atheism do not play a role in his story, at least as far as we can judge on the basis of Josephus' abridged version of it. We also do not find the motif of the reign of terror by the impure people, but again, that may be due to Josephus's abridgment. Be that as it may, here the Jews, explicitly so-called by Chiramon, are originally Egyptians who had to be expelled from Egypt at a divine command. <coughs> uh, Appion, the inventor of the notorious blood libel, displayed hatred towards the Hebrews, as Clement of Alexandria says, and he composed a book against the Jews. In this work, he also dealt with the departure of our ancestors from Egypt, as Josephus states. But unfortunately, the Jewish historian does not give details of this version, even though Appion was one of the main targets in his Contra Appionum. I mention Appion, however, because he was the last in the long range of Alexandrian writers, stretching from the first half of the third century BCE to the second half of the first century CE, to deal with the Exodus story in a way hostile to the Jews. After him, we have only the famous historian Tacitus, who sums it up, as if in repository, all the elements and features in the hostile Exodus versions of the four previous centuries in the extremely hostile excursion in Book Five of his Historiae. We should not forget that the pagan versions of the Exodus most probably enjoyed considerable popularity and were widely accepted as authentic accounts of Jewish origins. We now turn to the question, did the Jews, in Alexandria or elsewhere, react to these versions of the Exodus, and if so, how did they respond? The answer is, yes, they did, and their responses took a variety of forms. Again, it is not my purpose to be exhaustive here. I will focus on a very limited number of Jewish authors, namely Artapanus, Ezekiel the Tragedian, and the unknown author of the Wisdom of Solomon. Artapanus is a Jewish author who most probably lived in Egypt in the second century BCE. In his work on the Jews, of which only three fragments have been preserved, he discusses inter alia, the early history of Moses. There we read that Pharaoh Palmenothes, who dealt harshly with the Jews in Egypt, had a daughter named Maris, whom he gave as a wife to a certain Kenephres. Because she remained childless, she adopted as her own child one of the Jews, a baby she named Moses. When he reached manhood, he was called Musaeus by the Greeks and became the teacher of Orpheus. He bestowed many useful discoveries on humankind. He invented ships, machines for lifting stones, Egyptian weapons, devices for drawing water, fighting equipment, and philosophy. He also divided Egypt into 36 gnomes, and to each of the gnomes he assigned the god to be worshipped, cats, dogs, and ibises, and he entrusted the sacred writings to priests. He did all these things in order to keep the mon monarchy stable for Kenephres, his stepfather. He was loved by the masses and deemed worthy of divine honor by the priests who called him Hermes because of his skills in interpreting the sacred writings. But Kenephres became jealous and tried to kill Moses. 
He sent him with weak troops into a war with the Ethiopians, but Moses won every battle. Then he, Moses, and his troops built a city named after him, Hermopolis. Kenephraes made new attempts to assassinate Moses, but his own Egyptians began to hate him and reported his plots to Moses. <clears throat> Moses' brother Aaron advised him to flee to Arabia, which he did. There he married Raguel's daughter. He prayed to God that he might liberate his people from oppression, and a divine voice answered him from a mysterious fire that appeared out of the earth. It told him to rescue the Jews and return them to their ancient fatherland. Then Moses led a fighting force against Egypt and informed the king that he had come because the Lord of the universe had commanded him to liberate the Jews. The king imprisoned him, but at night the doors of the prison opened of their own accord. When the king asked Moses the name of the God who had sent him, Moses whispered the name into the king's ear, whereupon the king fell down speechless, but Moses revived him. Then follows a free version of the stories of the ten plagues, until finally the king released the Jews. Moses guided them to the Red Sea, where, according to some, he watched for the ebb tide and then led them through the dry part of the sea, but according to others, he struck the water with his rod at divine command so that it divided. When the Egyptians arrived at the sea in hot pursuit, a fire blazed in front of them and the sea again flooded their path. All the Egyptians were consumed by the fire and the flood. This is Artapanus' version. Now, it may seem a bit hazardous to start with Artapanus because his Jewishness has become a matter of debate lately. No less a scholar than Howard Jacobson has argued that Artapanus cannot have been a Jew because he not only adds details that are not found in the Bible, which is a common feature of Jewish ways of retelling the Bible, but he also adds elements that glaringly contradict the Bible, Moses' instituting animal worship in Egypt being the prime example of anti-biblical material. As Jacobson says, no Jew would have used the tale of Moses as an institutor of Egyptian animal worship. He compares Artapanus to the second century CE philosopher Numenius, who, being a pagan Platonist, shows his great admiration for Moses by saying, what else is Plato than a Moses writing in Attic? If Artapanus is a pagan author, it would seem I cannot use him in the present ar uh, argument. But is he? I, for one, cannot imagine what could possibly have been the motive of a pagan writer for depicting the figure of Moses as not only the institutor of animal worship, but also the inventor of such major cultural assets as ships, machines for lifting stones, devices for drawing water, fighting equipment, and, last but not least, philosophy. Moses, as the greatest cultural hero of human history, can hardly be a product of pagan imagination. What is imaginable, and even probable, is that a Jew, confronted with Egyptian slander about Moses as the leader of a bunch of Egypt-hating rebels, tries to silence these opponents in an act of radical revisionism by arguing, most probably tongue-in-cheek, that actually the Egyptians owe their own culture, including their religion, to this very Moses. The founder of the Jewish people is also the founder of Egyptian civilization. Even if, for the sake of the argument, we were to assume, that Arde, uh, assume Artapanus to be non-Jewish, then it still makes most sense to take this depiction of Moses to be a response to the Manetho style of Exodus stories. True, the emphasis is more on the other accomplishments of Moses than on the Exodus stricto sensu, but even so, it is a powerful response to the pervading motifs of misanthropy and atheism as characteristics of Moses and his followers in the Greco-Egyptian texts we have seen so far. It is not completely unthinkable, indeed, that a philo-Semitic pagan author stood up for the Jews and defended them against attacks such as we have seen, but it seems more likely that we have to do here with a rather exceptional Jewish author. Let us now turn to an author who is undoubtedly Jewish and whose main topic is the Exodus itself, Ezekiel the Tragedian. Ezekiel is a most remarkable man. His name is Hebrew, but he wrote Greek tragedies in the language and style and with the dramatic techniques of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. His subject, however, is fully biblical. Unfortunately, only one of his dramas has been preserved, and that only in part, 269 iambic trimeters are extant. But fortunately, that his work on the Exodus, uh, that is his work on the Exodus, the Exegoge. It is the only Jewish play known to us from antiquity, and it was probably intended to be staged, not just read. The drama follows the Septuagint version of Exodus 1 through 15 fairly closely, but adds several interesting Haggadic motifs, such as the appearance of the mythical phoenix, which heralds the inauguration of a new era in history. The most striking and controversial scene is a dream of Moses, in which he sees God upon his throne on top of Mount Sinai. God beckons him to come to his throne, hands him his regalia, and, leaving the throne himself, seats Moses upon it, whereupon all heavenly powers prostrate before Moses. 
It would seem that this indicates that according to Ezekiel, all power in heaven and earth has thus been handed over to Moses, who acts here as the vice regent or plenipotentiary of God. The synthesis of biblical story, Greek literary form, post-biblical Haggadah, and the theological speculation makes this play into one of the most typical products of Jewish Hellenism. The extant fragments present us with a monologue by Moses recounting the events in Exodus 1 and 2, a brief dialogue between Moses and Zipporah, an even briefer dialogue between a certain chum and Zipporah, and then follows Moses' dream version, uh, vision and Raguel's interpretation of the dream. Next is a long dialogue between God and Moses at the burning bush, including the precepts for Passover, further a monologue by a messenger reporting the exodus and the Egyptians' destruction in the Red Sea. Finally, we have a scout's report describing the oasis at Elim and the appearance of a spectacular bird. As Howard Jacobson has remarked, we find here several elements of a polemic against anti-Jewish exodus traditions. For instance, in line 130, the text says that when God had ordered Moses to the burning bush to place his hand in his bosom and then remove it, Moses' hand became like snow. The Hebrew Bible text has here that it became leprous, white as snow. Now, the omission of leprous is already found in the Septuagint, and after Ezekiel, we also find it in Philo's Life of Moses and Josephus' Jewish Antiquities. So the motif is not distinctive for our author, but it can hardly be doubted that all these sources omit the element of leprosy because it loomed so large in anti-Jewish propaganda. Manetho and Lysimachus spoke about the mob of leprous persons that had to be expelled from Egypt. And Moses himself is said to have been leprous by several ancient Greek authors. The omission of, Moses, uh, the, omission of the motif of Moses' leprous hand seems to be directed at this slander. Another well-known example is a passage in which God says to Moses, when you are about to leave, I will make the Egyptians well disposed to you and each of your women will receive from her neighbor vessels and raiment of all kinds, gold, silver, and garments so that the Egyptians will render payment to these mortals for the work they have done. This is a matter that was of concern to the Jews because the biblical text, although it repeatedly speaks of the Israelites borrowing things from the Egyptians at the Exodus, um, was sometimes interpreted by non-Jews in the sense that the Jews had robbed the Egyptians of their legal possessions when they left Egypt. This negative interpretation was made possible because the very last words of Exodus 12:36 are, thus they, the Israelites, stripped or plundered the Egyptians. This element apparently was seized upon by anti-Jewish writers who accused the Jews of theft and robbery. For instance, Pompeius Trogus, the first century BCE historian writes that Moses secretly stole sacred objects from the Egyptians. Elsewhere in Jewish literature, we find that this accusation very much bothered the Jews, and for that reason, they set forth the defense offered here by Ezekiel. What the Israelites took from the Egyptians was no more than their overdue wages. A final example in verses 167 to 169, we read immediately following the lines quoted above, that God says, when you reach your own land, you will have had a journey of seven days from that morning on which you left Egypt. But the Bible says the journey took 40 years. <clears throat> the reason for this drastic change of the biblical story is probably as follows. In a work, one of whose purposes was to propagandize for the Jews among the Greeks, it would not have been productive for the dramatist to include or even mention the wanderings of 40 years in the desert. In itself, 40 years of difficult wanderings might have diminished the sense of God's concern and aid for the Jews, which Ezekiel was eager to promote. To include the cause of these wanderings, that is, the sinfulness of the Jews, which impelled God to so punish them, would scarcely have increased the luster of these ancient Jews in the eyes of the pagan audience. No less telling is the fact that toward the end of the play, the author has the Egyptians shout, let us run back home and flee the hands of the Most High, for he is helping them, but on us he is wreaking destruction. Here, Ezekiel has the Egyptians confess that Israel's God is not only the most powerful, but also the Most High. In my opinion, we can safely assume that one of Ezekiel's purposes was to react to anti-Jewish versions of the Exodus story by means of a pro-Jewish play. The Wisdom of Solomon is a semi-philosophical wisdom text from the early first century CE that devotes no less than nine long chapters to the Exodus. In a series of seven antitheses, the author compares the Egyptians and the Israelites. For instance, the Egyptians were being slain by locusts and flies, while the Israelites survived a serpent attack through the agency of the bronze serpent. One more page. Yeah, yeah, it's the last page. <laughs> um, 
The Egyptians were unable to eat because the hideousness of the beasts sent against them, while Israel, after briefly suffering want, enjoyed exotic quail food. On the same night that the Egyptian firstborn were destroyed, Israel was summoned to God and glorified. And last but not least, in the final chapter, the Egyptians are accused of misoxenia, hatred of foreigners, or hostility towards strangers exactly the same accusation that was leveled against the Jews by Alexandrian Jew haters from the very beginning. This cannot be sheer coincidence. In styling the conduct of the Egyptians as misoxenia, the author is reversing the very charge made against the Jews by pagan contemporaries. And the reversal of the charge is here made in the context of the Exodus story. Apparently, this story in its anti-Jewish form was still in the air in the time of this author, as writers such as Chiron and Appian prove. It would be worthwhile to investigate whether Philo and Josephus yield evidence for polemics between Jews and pagans in their exodus stories, but time and space forbid. What little has been presented here hopefully suffices to demonstrate that the foundational event and myth of the Jewish people, the exodus from Egypt, remembered by Jews all over the world every year at Passover up till the present day, was a bone of contention right from the moment Jews and Greeks, especially Greco-Egyptians, came into contact with each other in the early Hellenistic period. The two opposite versions of the Exodus story easily lent themselves to give expression to the social tensions between these groups. Uh, I, would, I would like to ask Kathleen a question about the textual history of uh, Ezekiel the tragedian. But, uh, I did read the footnotes. Oh, good for you. Now, that was a terrific paper. I'd like to ask a question. Um, uh, Kathleen, you don't have to answer. But I'd, I'd like to direct this to Jan and Renee and Katerina, if I may. Since Manitho is making this amazing counter-memory of the Exodus, incorporating these old memories of, you know, transfigured memories of Amarna and the Hyksos and the Canaanite illness and so forth, my understanding is that no non-Jews were reading the Septuagint. That there's no, there's no textual indication anyway that any non-Jewish Greek uh, authors read or cited the Septuagint. So where would he know the story, and why would he care? <clears throat> um, th this I don't know, but I would like uh, to add a remark on uh, <clears throat> the identification of this Osar Zephos Osar with Achenaten. Mm -hmm. um, I think I, uh, following uh, following uh, Don Redford and others, I read the Manitho story <clears throat> as a, a memory of the Amarna right. period, right. and of course I got much criticism and contradiction because how uh, could it be that um, an episode in Egyptian history, which was so totally eradicated, and uh, <clears throat> um, uh, the name of the king erased from the king list and so on. How, how could this resurface a uh, thousand years later? Mm -hmm. um, and so um, uh, I, uh, I found another hint to the presence of a, uh, an Amarna memory at the same period, more or less. Than, uh, and this is in Diodorus. Uh, Diodorus reports uh, Egyptian um, um, uh, traditions about the pyramids. Well, uh, one say the three pyramids are built by, uh, by Cheops, Ephraim, Mykerinos, but there is still another tradition, that the three pyramids were built by uh, Armaios, Amasis, and Inaros. Well, and, and the only <coughs> interpretation of this strange uh, and apocryphal tradition is that these are the three uh, pharaohs that were able to overcome a severe crisis. So, uh, <clears throat> Armaios, this is Haremheb, who overcame the Amarna crisis, hmm. and he is given the Great Pyramid of Cheops, so the biggest crisis and the biggest. Uh, uh, um, Victor, and then um, Amazis, this is Achmose, the, um, uh, who expelled the Hyksos, overcame the Hyksos crisis, and Inaros uh, is the hero against the Assyrians. 
So um, hmm. the, the three pyramids are here connected with three Egyptian traumata, historical wounds, mm -hmm. so to speak, mm -hmm. traumata. Mm -hmm. and, and they are triumphant overcoming. Hmm. And uh, so this shows that even in the time of Diodorus, which is to say in the time of Hecateus of Abdera, because mm -hmm. Diodorus is just accepting, uh, Mm -hmm. There we are in the end of the fourth century, very close to Manitho, and it shows clearly that mm -hmm. uh, that the Amarna trauma, as a trauma, mm -hmm. yeah. was still somehow present in Egyptian memory. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, this co is a strong cooperation to the, this uh, interpretation of Manitho. Mm -hmm. And also, the traumatic theory, uh, the traumatic character of the Amana experience, the idea of suffering, mm -hmm. uh, is so uh, present uh, both in the Exodus story and in Manitho's report of the lepers. Uh, both stories begin with yeah. suffering, the Jews uh, suffering, the Israelites suffering from mm -hmm. Egyptian uh, <clears throat> slavery and oppression, the lepers suffering from forced labor in the eastern mm -hmm. desert, very much the same conditions, forced labor. Then um, the advent of a leader, Uzar Zef, in the Manitho story, Moses in the Exodus. Then the reversal of fortune, the suffering of the Egyptians in the Exodus story, the ten plagues in the Manitho story, uh, the rule, 13 years rule of the lepers and the shepherds, their mm -hmm. allies. Mm -hmm. and, and then, of course, uh, the inversion, the, the expulsion of the lepers and the liberation of the Israelites. Mm -hmm. So that <clears throat> there, there is a strong parallelism uh, included. So I think the, the, the two stories um, um, are much closer one to another as it appears at first look. It's amazing how Manitho's story is such an example of the different, what you call the Wanderstrasse of yeah. cultural memory. Exactly. And things are inverted and colored in different ways and combined. It really is remarkable. Would, would, would Egyptian writers have known uh, Jewish stories at that time? Uh, well, there were competing different stories, even among Jewish, about the Exodus. For example, uh, some people, some scholars say that the history by Ecateus of Abdera of Exodus is a Jewish one, is a kind of archaic, maybe archaic form of the, in my opinion, is an archaic form of the myth of Moses. Moses is a conquering king that conquers Canaan and then founded Jerusalem as well as Omri founded Samaria and the temple and the royal temple, the dynastic temple. Mm. So maybe, in fact, most of the pagan stories seems to be more, at least in my opinion, or in opinion, for example, of Gruen, seems more to be a, a, um, the confutation of a story like the historic the story told in Ecateus than, than the Bible, right, as we right, have. Right. Okay, but, but Eric Gruen, who you cite, taught me that the Greeks didn't pay attention to any of this stuff. That it was all in inner Jewish discourse, but Manitho shows that they were aware and felt strongly about it. Maybe the, the truth is in the middle. Yeah, yeah, and it makes sense that if the Greeks and Jews in Alexandria are competing with each other and there's tension there, that you use the other community stories to There was a period, them. as I tried to tell uh, in my, my paper, there was a period of great interest in yeah. the story, history of Egypt and the history mm -hmm. of various population of... Uh, great, okay, thank you.